Hello, everyone. This is Channel 781 News. I'm Josh Kastorf, and today I have the privilege of interviewing someone who, more than anyone else, inspired me to learn more about and get more involved in the Waltham community and inspired a lot of people I know as well. I am here with former city councilor Christine Mackin. Hi, Josh. Thank you for that extremely kind introduction, and I'm looking forward to talking with you today. Thank you so much. So uh, Christine uh, moved to Waltham in 2009 to get to study at Brandeis. She got her PhD in biochemistry in 2014. And then she served as the ward counselor on the Waltham City Council, the ward counselor uh, for Ward 7 from 2018 until just a few weeks ago when the new council was inaugurated with the new Ward 7 counselor, Paul Cates. So, uh, Christine, how are you feeling about no longer being on the council? I am, at this point, I'm honestly feeling liberated is the word that I landed on for this. Um, I enjoyed serving on council, but it is a lot of work. And you end up having to divide your attention between a lot of different issues. Um, and now that I'm not on the city council, right now I'm just really enjoying having some time back in my life and focusing on individual things that matter to me instead of spreading myself really thin with the problems of an entire community. Yeah, when we saw you um, at the council meeting, the last council meeting in December, Chris asked you, what were you, what would you miss the least about the council? And you said there are some big personalities. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? There, um, so we have 15 members on the Waltham City Council and everybody in there ran for office because there's something about them that wants to serve the community, but is also really willing to put themselves in front of people, uh, door knocking and making speeches and standing up on the council floor. Um, some more than others, when they get up and start talking, it can really suck the air out of the room. Um, and it doesn't leave us a lot of space for discussion or debate or disagreement. Um, and some other counselors can be real sticklers for the rules the way they are written, um, whereas others have a little bit more flexibility. So it's honestly just a relief not to worry so much about, am I rubbing somebody the wrong way? Or is the way I'm presenting myself gonna set somebody off tonight? Or do I really wanna raise my hand to speak after we've spent 15, 30, and uh, 60 minutes on this issue already? Do I have anything to contribute at this point? So less going on yeah. in my brain all the time. <laughs> it sounds like uh, it can be a really stressful environment. Um, do you have any advice for our new counselors who are now uh, just diving into that? I definitely think the first thing that they should do is to find an experienced counselor that they feel like they can trust and they get along with to try to set up either a formal or informal kind of mentoring situation. I had that with Counselors Darcy and McMiniman and McLaughlin, who I sat between, um, and having the three of them to lean on really made a huge difference, especially in the first year to pick their brains on what was going on and what the rules were, what I was allowed and not allowed to do. Um, so the first thing is find somebody you can trust who's on the council, who has a little bit of experience to talk to. And then the second thing is to make sure that your network outside of city council is really strong too, that uh, Colleen spoke about this a little, that it took a community to get her elected, and I think it takes community support to keep serving as well. Um, things are going to come up that counselors aren't familiar with on an individual level, and it helps to have people they can go talk to in their ward and outside of it to say, what do you think about this issue? Or, I am having a big feeling after this council meeting. Can I talk to somebody who's not on council about it? And it helps to get that both inside and outside of your home, too. So definitely reach out to folks. That's interesting. That's one thing I've observed about the council is it does seem like counselors rely on other counselors a lot um, to learn the rules and learn the background on issues. Is there kind of a danger that as a new counselor, you know, you might be, you might be learning something that's biased in a way that's going to prevent you from accomplishing the things you want? And are there other ways a counselor can learn these things besides just the kind of uh, institutional memory? That's actually a really great question because um, this is something that is completely not visible to people outside the city council, but we actually in Massachusetts have an organization called the Massachusetts Municipal Association. Um, 
and they do a training for new counselors in, I think, November or December in election years. Um, and I know both of our incoming counselors went to that training this year. And then they also do a conference in January at the Hyatt Convention Center that, if you're a huge nerd like me, is an enormous amount of fun. Um, but it gets you uh, to connect with counselors outside of Waltham. And it really just broadens your network outside of this individual municipality. And I think is a really cool and fun program. Because I'm a big dork and I like talking about <laughs> wonky stuff, which is what goes on at the MMA conference. Yes, yes. I remember actually that was going to be my next question because when we, ah. when Chris talked you at that meeting, you said your favorite thing about being on the council um, is researching uh, policy issues and learning <laughs> about policy. What are the policy issues that are interesting to you right now? So there's something that's going on um, that's going to impact Waltham and a bunch of other municipalities that is directly related to the thing that I think is both the most interesting and the most important in Waltham, which is zoning. Um, zoning dictates what kinds of buildings you can put where. And it has, in Waltham, it's enormously complicated and it keeps getting more complex every time there's a change made. But there was a state law passed last year that uh, dictates to municipalities that are on the MBTA transit network that you have to adopt um, new zoning to allow denser development close to those transit hubs. Um, and that's something that I know Newton is talking about, whether they want to forego some of their state grants in exchange for not updating their zoning. And actually a lot of municipalities are talking about that. Um, and zoning can either be a really powerful tool to help people to have more development go on in a way that's conscious of the community and who's going to gain and who's going to lose. Um, it can also help keep residential tax rates low, um, or it can be something that really hurts people. If you are prohibiting development that is going to put in housing that's really needed, or if you're permitting a lot of high-end development that ends up contributing to gentrification and displacement. So understanding the zoning as written, but also understanding how you can use zoning to solve the actual problems of Waltham is a really thorny and interesting question. One of the things that impacted Ward 7, and I'm actually looking out my window because I can see right to it, is uh, Boston Children's Hospital came in and wanted to change the permitting to allow a construction on top of a surface parking lot that exists on their site. Um, and so when they came in with that permit, the way it was drawn, uh, the amount of construction that would be allowed under it actually went and read ordinances for like healthcare facilities in a bunch of different communities and looked at if we allow zoning worded the way the application came in, what sorts of things could they build? What has happened in other communities? And what we've seen with examples like that is that what Children's Hospital is doing actually is building hubs in lots of other communities outside of Boston. Um, and on the one hand, that allows them to provide a lot more care to patients. But on the other hand, it drives a lot more traffic to particular sites. And that was my concern as a ward counselor was really overburdening the infrastructure we're getting um, that, that Waltham is responsible for without necessarily seeing gains in benefits to the community. It's interesting to hear about the, the wide range of of some really interesting and some really mundane things that you, you dealt with on the council. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, there was a particular moment from your tenure on the council that got talked about a lot more than any other. And so I wanna ask you about that. That was in the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, you, during a meeting to finalize the city budget, um, you proposed a cut to the police budget. Um, if I have this right, you proposed cutting three line items that would mm -hmm. have totaled about $1.1 million out of the $17 million total budget. So that's 6%. That's about a 6%. Mm -hmm. And reading about people talking about this online, people had different ways of describing what you were trying to do, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what you were trying to accomplish by making that proposal. So, so I wanna ask you finally, what was your intention? What were you trying to accomplish by making that proposal at that time? So each of the line items that I was speaking to had a specific resonance to me as a politician and as a member of the community. And I hope to other people in Waltham. 
The first and biggest line item, the, the biggest contributor to that $1.1 million figure is the police overtime budget in Waltham. Um, the way that the police are paid in the city, um, they have a base salary. And then if they work overtime beyond their contracted number of hours, they get time and a half, I think, which soaks up a lot of money out of the budget. Like I said, close to or over a million dollars most years. And in my four years on the council, to my knowledge, there was never any oversight on what those overtime hours are being used for. And if the police are actually performing work that is essential to the community in all of those overtime hours. And I bring that up specifically because there has been in the state of Massachusetts numerous occasions where police departments are using overtime as kind of a slush fund to get more money out of the system and into their own pockets. And I wanted to remove that from a line item in the budget so that the council would have more oversight power over that particular spending. It wasn't saying we're not going to pay the police for the hours worked. What I was trying to say is we need to make sure that they are using this time and this money responsibly and the council needs leverage to make sure that we have the visibility into the hours that the, this department is putting in. Did you have a reason to think there was a problem with how they were using the overtime in Waltham or was this strictly you felt as a matter of principle that this needed to be reviewed? It's strictly a matter of principle because without that kind of visibility, we don't know. Um, I never heard from either the rumor mill or from any reliable sources of any shenanigans in Waltham. But given what we have seen at the state police and at the Boston police, it's a concern that I think needs to be taken seriously in departments all across the state of Massachusetts, including Waltham. And how does it compare when you say we need to have oversight? How does the oversight that the city council applies to that apply to how, how closely they look at other departments? Well, that are, or I guess, the <laughs> no, that's they ask question. questions about overtime in other departments? Yeah, um, we never looked at overtime hours in any department. Um, and most departments actually do come in with a certain amount of overtime spend in each of their departmental budgets. The difference is that for the police department, both in terms of a dollar figure and as a percentage of their total spend, it's much higher for the police department than it is for other departments. And when we look at overtime spending scandals across the state, this is one of the things I do in my day job and also on the city council is looking at analog situations, places where we can learn something from other communities without making the same mistake. Um, seeing that problem pop up in other communities says maybe we need to take a look at it in Waltham too. And if we look and we find that there's no problem, great, then we have learned that there is no problem and we can just go forward with that in the future. But if we don't look for an issue, then we don't know whether or not there's actually something going on there. So the two other line items, and correct me if I'm wrong, one was for NEMLEC, which is mm -hmm. the, the dues that Waltham pays to be part of a regional mm -hmm. law enforcement association, I think is the right word for it. And they provide things that the local police wouldn't have like a SWAT team. The other one was a line item for ammunition mm -hmm. that was part of the training budget. So can you talk about those two things? Yeah. So. For the NEMLEC organization, um, I'm not comfortable with that organization, period. Uh, the way they present themselves is very aggressive um, in a way that I don't think is appropriate for an, an organization that is supposed to be about the safety of our communities. And I would encourage anybody who's interested in that to look up what NEMLEC does and the issues that that organization has had around transparency. Uh, and how they spend their money and the tone of what they put out into the world in writing. Uh, it is not comforting in my opinion. <laughs> um, and then the ammunition budget, that was something that is primarily a symbolic gesture to the community. Um, and that came out of the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the mass uprising that we saw nationwide and participating in the Black Lives Matter March here in Waltham. The question that I think we need to be asking is 
to what extent do we want officers who are meant to ensure the safety of the community to be carrying lethal weapons? That's not something that you see in a lot of countries around the world that have lower rates of crime and lower rates of violence than we do in the United States. Do we want to be empowering these people to take others' lives? Um, obviously, can, you can do that with and without a gun, but having a gun makes it easier. Um, now, to be completely transparent with your audience, the reason the ammunition budget in Waltham is relatively high is because we have an indoor shooting range which means that we have to use lead-free ammunition, which is a little more costly than older ammunition that you could use at an outdoor range where the health concerns aren't as bad, which is why I said that was purely a symbolic gesture rather than a practical suggestion for a long-term change to the, to the police department. But I did feel that it was important to show the community that it was something that the council was thinking and talking about, not just something that we reflexively approve spending. Where is Waltham now in terms of the conversation about police policy? Um, we think... had a Black Lives Matter, oh, sorry, to, to the back yeah, there was a Black Lives Matter march in Waltham with over a thousand people summer of 2020. Um, and a lot of people had different ideas about was that a response to a national issue or did that mean something for Waltham? And there was a lot of talk, uh, public talk about it when you proposed these cuts. I haven't seen a lot of public talk about it since. So wh where do you think we're at? Should we be talking about it? And specifically, what should we talk about when we talk about police? <sighs> so I think, unfortunately, we're worse off than we were before. Um, I think that the reactionary response from a lot of community members in Waltham has really driven that conversation back out of the public domain, um, which honestly is a little bit scary that I feel like that's something that we can't talk about. And I think other community, community members may feel the same way. Um, and having that kind of environment is, is not good for our democracy or for a political engagement to have a place where even, even having a conversation, it feels frightening. Um, and I think that's happened in a lot of places across the country, uh, not just in Waltham, but in Waltham, we've definitely like slid backwards a little bit. Um, I think that the march we had here in Waltham was a response to a national issue, but I also think we can't pretend that Waltham isn't part of this country. We're not an isolated community. And there are ways in which we are unique, but there are ways in which we have the same problems as everywhere else. Um, and so that march that happened was obviously sparked by this nationwide uprising. But if you talk to a wide, a wide distribution of community members in Waltham, there are people who have had concerning incidents with local police or who feel profiled or who feel unsafe in the presence of our officers. Um, and that is true here and it's true elsewhere as well. When you say people feel profiled, when you say people mm -hmm. have had a negative experience, is that an image issue? Is it a matter of the communication between police and citizens needs to be better? Or do you think it goes deeper than that? I think it goes deeper than that. Um, so I'm gonna like, I'm a white lady. I don't get pulled over by cops when I'm driving down the street. I don't get like talked to when I'm walking around my neighborhood, like I blend in. Um, but honestly, what's coming to mind most for me is, is two social media posts. So these are out in public that somebody could go find where two different people, one of whom was uh, a black doctor working at Children's and one of whom was a Hispanic student at Brandeis both had encounters with Waltham police where they felt like they were being profiled. They didn't perceive a valid reason to have that interaction with the police get started. Um, and maybe the police officer does feel justified in that moment, talking to that individual, pulling over that individual for whatever reason. But I'm less concerned with how the police perceive that moment than I am with how the community member perceives that moment, because there is an inherent power differential in that interaction where the police person is carrying a lethal weapon and has the force of the law behind them. And if they are interacting with the public in a way that makes 
those people feel profiled makes them feel unsafe in this community that is a problem given mm -hmm. that you know people feel there's this environment where people aren't sure whether it's safe to talk about the police publicly what what can we do what people who feel that there needs to be a conversation about police policy in Waltham. What advice would you give them? Gosh. Talk about it with people you trust. Talk about it with your family and your close friends and your network and your neighbors. Um, talk about it to people that you already know and trust and maybe don't go posting on social media. <laughs> do, it, do it in a grassroots organizing kind of way, like an old fashioned organizing kind of way where it's really based on having conversations with people you know and not yelling on Facebook. Thank you.